you're a woman. Now what's interesting, and I want to point out, is a lot of this data doesn't come from Mexico, and it doesn't come from many other countries because it's not reported. So a lot of it does come from the US, but I think it also means that it's happening in many other places. Well, this is uh, a study that looked at access to the ICU. Who got admitted to the ICU? And it was a prospective cohort study in France of triage to the intensive care unit from 15 emergency departments. And they looked specifically at patients who were greater than or equal to 80 years of age. They applied standard criteria for admission to the ICU. So what they found is that there were about 1,400 patients over the age of 80 who met criteria to be admitted to an ICU. However, only 31% were actually referred for admission to the ICU. And of those patients, only 52% actually were admitted to an ICU. So it really boils down to only 16% of elderly patients who met criteria were actually admitted to an ICU. What about use of interventions? Now, this is an older study from the United States about pulmonary artery catheter use. But what they found is that catheters were used more commonly in white race, if people had private insurance, and if they were in a surgical ICU. You can also see that the presence of trainees influenced the use of pulmonary artery catheters. No trainees, lower incidence. More trainees, higher incidence of use. Something that you may not notice unless you look at the data. This is also uh, comes from the United States where they looked at the effect of insurance coverage on mortality and procedures in critically ill patients. And they adjusted for all the characteristics. And so the odds ratio of one is for patients with insurance. So for patients without insurance, they're more likely to die and they're less likely to receive a central venous catheter, a tracheostomy, or hemodialysis. We didn't think that that was happening, but it is. We also know that there's an inequality in resources that are available. This is a study that came from Africa at an Africa. anesthesiology conference where they did de una a conferencia de anesthesiología hicieron una encuesta sobre poder implementar las guías de surviving sepsis. High income countries, but the majority of those that responded were from low income African countries. So what they found is that only about 5 to 6% had the ability to implement all the grade one recommendations from the guidelines. Looking at the resuscitation bundle, that three hour bundle, only 16% had the ability to implement that bundle. Now, what about in Mexico or Latin America? Well, very little data, but there was a survey of intensivists from 11 countries in Latin America that was recently published. And again, I think these were many higher resource countries, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Mexico. And they found that 85% said they had adequate resources to treat septic shock. But there was more dissatisfaction in public hospitals. So in the public hospitals, 14% were not even able to measure lactate, compared to 5% in private intensive care units. Getting a lactate result in less than two hours, less likely to happen in a public hospital. Getting a CAT scan in less than two hours, also less likely in public hospitals. So there is an inequality, even in Latin America, in the resources that we have for our critically ill patients. Well, what about the patient outcomes? The most common that we look at is mortality, and we know that there are differences associated with gender, race, and socioeconomic level, and I'll show you one example of that. 
But the other outcomes that we should be looking at, of course, are functional outcomes. And here, there's very limited data. So survivors of the intensive care unit, how well do they go back to their standards of living, their stand ability to function in their homes? What we do know is that patients that are not of white race are less likely to be referred to a rehabilitation facility. So again, less opportunity, perhaps, to return to their prior level of functioning. So this is an example of inequalities that occur in ARDS. And here, uh, patients of black race and Hispanics suffer greater mortality. One of the reasons is the way they present. So these are the underlying conditions that are associated with ARDS by race. So in black race, it's more likely to be sepsis and pneumonia. Asians, bronchoaspiration and trauma. Hispanics, sepsis and trauma. Whereas for the white race, it's typically after surgery. Well, of course, sepsis, infection, trauma carry high, higher mortality. So the fact that they have these inciting events predisposes to worse outcomes. So what about research in critical care? So there's three aspects, I think, where there's inequalities. Enrollment in clinical studies, how representative the patients are of the patients that we actually care for, and then the reporting of results. And I think we're all aware that there is a bias to publish positive studies rather than negative. But there's also a bias in that negative studies are often not even submitted for publication. But let's look at enrollment in clinical studies. There is an effect of race. Two aspects here. One is the ability to approach someone to get consent, in other words, finding a substitute decision maker. And then also, race influence people's refusal to participate in clinical studies. This is one example of a pediatric study of respiratory failure that was looking at sedation. So not being able to find a decision maker happened in almost 20% if the race was black, and only 11% if the race was white. Those that refused consent, higher in the black race, 29%, 18% in the white race. And you can see the Hispanic race falls in the middle here. So we have a difficulty in getting the right patients into our clinical studies. Well, how representative is data that we collect for critical care? If you look at the data that was used to develop the definitions for sepsis 3, they used data from the United States, from two centers, high-income country, 70 predominantly white race, 14% black, 10% other. I don't know where the Hispanics fall, but probably in the other. Now, this may represent the composition of the population in the United States, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the population around the world nor does it reflect the population that ends up in the intensive care unit. The early goal-directed trial, the process trial, 68% white, 25% black. That's actually probably reflective of the patients that come to the emergency department and the ICU. The ARDSnet, predominantly white, only 6% Hispanics, whereas the United States has at least 12% Hispanics. So it's not reflective of the patient population that we serve. So what can you do? first of all, recognize the inequalities that exist. Analyze your data. Almost every hospital collects quality data, and that's a good place to start. Look at your data by gender. Look at it by race. Look at it by age groups. I think you might be surprised what you find. Use protocols in the hospital, in the intensive care unit, that are applied consistently 
and equally to all individuals. That would include admission criteria for the intensive care unit, protocols for managing patients with different diseases. Try the best you can to ensure that your enrollment in clinical trials that you are, are in charge of is reflective of your patient population. And if you do have those results, even if negative, publish them. So now I'd like to kind of look at a different aspect of inequality in critical care, and that's the inequality that occurs in our team. So there's many different types of inequality, compensation, promotion, your, your status, academic status, the work that you are asked to perform, and the factors that can influence these inequalities can be age, gender, could be your ethnic background. So I want to show you an example of age, and then I'm going to concentrate on gender because it's something that I probably have a bias about. So inequality of age. So in the United States, surveys have found that doctors between the age of 46 and 55 work more hours than either younger or older doctors. And the doctors that are younger, 36 to 45 years old, work the least number of hours. Now, in the survey that was done in Latin America, it's a little bit different. Young intensivists work more night shifts, and it was probably thought that the young intensivists between age 31 and 50 also work the most hours. So a little bit different than the United States, but still <clears throat> an inequality. What about salaries? So this data comes from the US because that's one of the few places in the world that publishes some of this data. And if you look at the members of the team, the pink is women, blue is men. Men are set to a, a value of one. All women, whether it be in nurses, um, nurse practitioners, respiratory therapists, make much less than their male colleagues. This is intensivist. Women intensivists make about 25% less salary than men. Here's a little bit of data about salaries from Mexico that comes from surveys that were done, and, but it's really not specific to intensivists. But they did note that women physicians make much less than men physicians. And then they group them by salary groups. And what you see is that more women are in the lower salary groups, whereas there are more men in the higher salary groups. So again, a significant inequality that isn't necessarily explained by legitimate reasons. So what are some of the reasons for this gap in salary? Some people say that women work less hours. That's not been shown to be true. Some have said women are less productive. That's not true. So basically, women do equal work for unequal pay. It is true that women undervalue their services. The other causative factor is prejudice, bias, and discrimination. And there's really two types, explicit, which is overt, overt discrimination, but what we usually run up against is implicit. It's unrecognized biases that occur when it comes to gender. Women tend to underestimate their value because they're indoctrinated from early age to not complain, not to appear egotistical, and they're not as competitive. So it's an environmental and cultural um, environment that yields that. Also, women are not comfortable discussing money or salary in general. But there's also a gap in negotiation. And this is one that I, I think is very true, is that uh, men tend to ask for what they think is their right, what they want. Uh, it's what I'm entitled to. Women tend to ask for what they think they are worth what's justified by their talents. 
But the other thing to remember is that discrimination cannot be negotiated. So that is something that will always potentially play a role. Here's an example of that implicit bias. Now, it's not in physicians, but it was in academic science faculty. And what happened is they were given job resumes, applications, for the head of a laboratory. The applications were exactly the same, but some had a feminine name, others had a masculine name. That was the only difference. So what you see, they judged women is in the lighter gray. Women were judged to be less competent, less and they would less, be less likely to be offered mentorship. The same information. Women were offered a lower salary. But the interesting thing, too, is that the gender of the academic faculty, the science faculty, didn't make a difference. So women were just as guilty of this implicit bias as men were. So interesting, and I'm sure many of you have probably run into similar occurrences. What about research funding? This is what came from uh, Canada just this year, and it's a great experiment because they changed the way they did their process for reviewing grants. So stage one, they focused on the quality of the investigator. Stage two and three, they looked at the quality of the research project. <coughs> Here's what they found. So stage one, where they focused on the individual investigator, you'll see that women were not successful. There's a gap. The dark green is the men. Light green is women. There's a gap. These are two year. This is a year period and another year period. So when they focused on an individual, women didn't get the same level of funding. When they focused on the quality of the project in stage two and three, women and men had equal funding. So another example of some of the implicit bias that occurs. What about in our publications? Some of you may have seen some of this information. Women make up about 7.5% of editorial boards of critical care journals five top critical care journals. That was embarrassing because it was less than the percent of women on editorial boards of orthopedic surgery. And you can see the percent here, and this is back in 2010. So I wanted to update you and show you that there has been progress in many respects. Unfortunately, not in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, but all the other journals have increased the percentage of women on their editorial boards. So there's progress. What about task forces in intensive care medicine? So in this study, they compared women on task forces with women authors of intensive care articles. So one of the issues that many people bring up is that there are no qualified women for these task forces. So what this group did is said that if there's women that are publishing as first and last author, then they probably are qualified. And so what they found that 15% of the authors of critical care articles were women. But look at the task forces. This was research in critical care, 16% women, so that's actually not bad. For the European Society um, Task Force on Colloid Therapy, not too bad. The definition of ARDS, zero women. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign Committee in 2012 was 10% women, but those were not all physicians. The Shock Hemodynamic Management Guidelines from the European Society, zero women. Sepsis definitions, zero women. So there are qualified women. They are not included in these task forces. What about conferences? So again, this is older data from 2012. But this looks at all women presenting in a conference. 
And in blue, it's actually women physicians. So you can see very little representation in the Brussels meeting. 15% here, 25% in the Society of Critical Care Medicine, 37% in Australia. Keep in mind that in most professional organizations, women intensivists make up about 30 to 35% of the membership. And that's true here in Mexico as well. Has there been progress since this time? Yes and no. So the Society of Critical Care Medicine is around 30%, but these are not all physicians. So women intensivists still may be underrepresented. European society has not made much difference since 2015 and 2017. Brussels meeting, a little bit better, but still very low representation. But look at this one. This is the College of the Intensive Care Medicine in Australia. And it will, I'll show you why this has gone up. There are almost 35% women intensivists in their professional meetings. So what do we need to do? Well, first of all, recognize the inequalities, both age, gender, ethnicity, that are occurring in your team and what those consequences are. We should seek a conscious, deliberate balance of gender in our committees, in our task forces, our editorial boards, consensus panels. We need to publish those metrics of diversity. We shouldn't be embarrassed by them. We should look at them and then take responsibility and be accountable for that data. Salaries, academic promotion should be transparent. Putting people on committees should be transparent. Training and diversity is helpful, but the key here is to change the culture of the institution or your organization. We have to have an implementation plan. We can't just talk about it. The other important aspect of overcoming these inequalities is to include the collaboration of both sexes. There are better changes for equality when both men and women work on these issues together. This is the example I wanted to leave with you. Uh, and this is an example of the organizational commitment. This is the College of Intensive Care Medicine in Australia. And they actually issued a guideline for achieving gender balance at their events. And they set goals and they made these goals public so that by 2022, they will have 50% of their conference participants will be women. And they publish these metrics. So I think it's a good example of how you can move forward and try to overcome some of these inequalities. So I'll leave that with you, and thank you very much for your attention. Gracias.